this morning I want to look at uh, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, I, I apologize to the media guys for not having the actual verses on, on, on slides, but I do have my points on slides, so uh, not all is lost. But uh, Exodus chapter 15, and I want to look at this question. Uh, you can go ahead and put the title slide up, Philip. Little clever play on words. 2021, did 2020 win in your life? Uh, did the circumstances that we faced in 2020 cause you to take your eyes off of God? Did it cause you to doubt uh, the love that God has for you? For the last several years, it's been a running joke on social media, if you pay attention to those kinds of things, uh, to complain about the previous year and say that the coming year couldn't get any worse. All right, maybe you've seen it, maybe uh, you've done it. I've done it, okay? Uh, you know, 2015, so glad 2015 is over. Can't wait for, you know, all the good things that are going to happen in 2016. You know, and then 20, end of 2016. Uh, so glad that 2016 is over. Can't wait for the things that 2017 is going to bring us. You know, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, December 31st of 2019, I decided to be cheeky. And uh, I just said 2020 and then shared a, a GIF, a, a, a movie picture of someone sharpening a knife. All right. And that I, we hadn't even heard of COVID at that point, you know, but look at what has happened to us in 2020. Um, if this year had anything to do with taking your eyes off of God, I want you to know you're not alone. Uh, that has happened to a great many Christians uh, even myself at times, we've taken our eyes off of God and all that he has done in our lives, but we can't blame the year. Okay. The year had nothing to do with it. Uh, could have just as easily happened in, uh, 2024 or, you know, name some other year. The things that happen to us, they're not done by the years. The things that happen to us are happening to us sometimes just because that's life. Uh, we're as Christians, we're not immune to life happening to us. We're not immune to the circumstances that everybody is going to face. Uh, we see many times in Psalms and Proverbs that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We will experience life. We will experience trial and hardship. Sometimes that may come from Satan. Sometimes it's our own uh, fooling, uh, uh, foolishness. Sometimes it's our own bad decisions. Uh, and we have to face the consequences of those sometimes. Uh, but what we cannot do is allow those circumstances, allow those things in life to take our eyes off of God, to ruin our thankfulness and our gratitude. It's not the years that are doing things to us. All right. It's our attitude and our reaction to those things. Let me remind you that, in fact, it can get worse. Only a person who lacks historical perspective and, and uh, could look at, uh, has, has no concept of history would say that things can't get any worse than they are right now. Uh, okay, so uh, again, you're not alone. Uh, sometimes I think, oh, how can things get any worse? Uh, but if we aren't careful, we'll find ourselves in the situation of Israel uh, where we're backed up against the Red Sea and we're complaining against God. We're thinking that God has led us out here to die. Uh, so how do we avoid letting 2021 win in our lives? How do we prevent the things that will happen to us in this year and in and, and every year that follows from uh, getting the better of us? How do we prevent that from happening? Well, actually, I want to show you what happened to the Israelites after the Red Sea and what they did in order to uh, kind of form our response. Yes, it became a pattern for the Israelites. God would provide a, a, an amazing miracle. He would do something incredible uh, that no eye or mind could understand in the Israelites' life. And then, you know, just a couple of days later, they're complaining. But it also shows us how we can break the pattern uh, for that. And so let's read Exodus 15 verses one through three. We won't read the whole, uh, chapter here, but Exodus one verse 15 says, then sang Moses and the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord and spake saying, I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. 
The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Let's pray before we begin. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for uh, the many miracles that you've worked in our lives, and I pray that we would uh, never forget those. I pray that we would uh, hear from your word what you would have us to hear. I pray that it would not be my words, but your words that speak to us, and that we would leave here changed by what we hear, what we have heard. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So I think most of us are familiar with uh, where the Israelites are right now and having just come through the Red Sea. But I want to give a, a, a short refresher and add a little bit of context. They've just been delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians by many plagues, many miracles that God has worked. And so these plagues were not just uh, to prove to the Egyptians that God is who he says he is, but also to the Israelites that God is who he says he is. If you'll look back when uh, Moses came out of the wilderness with the staff and began to say that uh, he was going to lead the Israelites, that it was, it was time. God is going to cause the Israelites to uh, move out of Egypt. The leaders of the Israelite nation didn't believe him. They didn't have faith that what he said was true. And so he cast down his rod and it turned into a snake. And he turned the water into blood in front of the Israelite leaders so that they would believe. And all the plagues that happened uh, were not just for the Egyptians to cause them to want to uh, kick out the, Is the Israelites. They were also for the Israelites to prove that this was God who was doing it. And that it was time and that, uh, it was who he, uh, that God is who he says he was. And so we know that that last plague, the, the angel of death that went through and killed the firstborn of uh, every household uh, and uh, the firstborn of all the cattle, every, every household that didn't have blood on the doorpost, the firstborn in that house was, was killed. And so through that, God caused Pharaoh to uh, let the Israelites go. He said, you go and you serve your God. It didn't last long, did it? Uh, he began to think that uh, God had led them out into the wilderness so that now he could uh, re-enslave them. And so he gives chase to the Israelites, and the Israelites are backed up against the Red Sea. All right? Not only are they backed up against the Red Sea. How many of you, uh, you've been to the beach? Has anyone been to the beach? Uh, especially down, my favorite is Pensacola, uh, the, the Emerald Coast area, uh, beautiful white sand beaches. Uh, it wasn't like walking into the Gulf of Mexico or into the Atlantic Ocean. They're trapped between two mountains, all right? There's nowhere for them to go. They can't split up and, and, and uh, get away from the Israelites that way because there's mountains, and they're not going to just walk into the Red Sea. They forgot that there was a cloud that was protecting them. They forgot that uh, that cloud was the angel of God that was sent there to uh, uh, protect them, uh, from the sun by day and, and was a pillar of fire by night. And so they began to complain to Moses. Moses says, fear not. And then God tells Moses to, to raise his rod. And as he does that, the Red Sea is split. And not only is the Red Sea split, but the ground at the bottom of that sea is dry for them to walk across. Um, and so they do. The, some people think that there may have been as many as three million Israelites that are crossing the Red Sea. And so they begin to cross. And then I imagine, you know, kind of like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I got this from uh, the Ten Commandments movie, but you know, as the last Israelite steps out of the Red Sea, uh, the cloud that was keeping the Egyptians back is removed. And the Egyptians are now able to charge across the Red Sea. As a military strategist, that has to be like the worst decision ever, right? I mean, you have no idea. You've never seen the sea parted like that before. And you think that you're just going to be able to charge in there, you know, and, and, and uh, kill these people or, or drag them back into slavery. No one would ever do that. But Pharaoh, I think, you know, being drawn by God or maybe drawn by, by um, you know, his own pride, charges forward and instead of being on dry ground, the ground is now muddy and they're caught in that mud. 
all the horses and all the Egyptians, they're caught in that mud so that they can't escape. And then I imagine as the last Egyptian is caught in the mud, the waters just collapse and kill them all. Not only has Israel been completely uh, redeemed through this situation, but the Israelite or the Egyptians have been completely destroyed. They are now free. No one's going to drag them back into slavery. And yet we find out that it doesn't take long before they're, they're willing to go back into slavery, right? They're, they're willing to go back and enjoy uh, sitting by the flesh pots uh, and having uh, everything that they could ever want just at, uh, uh, at, at demand, whenever they wanted. They become unthankful. But history tells us that it took many hundreds of years for the Egyptian empire to really recover from this great loss. Uh, in Exodus 15, we have this song of Moses. Uh, we have this song of praise, not just of Moses, but of the whole Israelite nation singing this praise is what the Bible tells us. Uh, praising God for what he has done. And like I said, we won't take time to read all of, the, all of uh, Exodus 15, but we will uh, look at several other verses. Um, it's a beautiful account of the victory that God had won for Israel. It, it's, you know, so, so thorough a victory that your mind is just boggled at the fact that they could complain about water and food. Not many days later, they're complaining against God. First about the water at Mara, then in the wilderness of Sinai. But in every instance, God took care of them. God met their needs that they had, despite their faithlessness and their ingratitude. So where are we in this story? You know, this is... Uh, a, a story of what happened to Israel. And I don't believe that the Israel and, and the church and we as Christians are directly interchangeable. We can't just claim whatever promises from the Old Testament were made to Israel and claim them uh, for our own. There's a historical context. So where are we? Uh, wh what's the purpose of this passage for us? I think that there's uh, some, some, some principles and some things that we can adopt in our Christian life that will help us to be thankful and help us to uh, not take our eyes off of God. And so we've just come through a pretty wild year. I mean, I don't think anybody could really argue against that, right? I mean, 2020 was, was, was pretty wild. It's not as bad as uh, what other people have faced, but uh, we did have a plague, right? There was all kinds of upheaval, all kinds of economic fallout, all kinds of of uh, physical uh, problems, maybe uh, all kinds of uh, problems from being cooped up with your family for, you know, a better part of a year now. Um, we won't pretend that those don't happen, but we're fooling ourselves if we think that the year is doing something to us in and of itself. Instead of rejoicing that 2020 is over, we need to rejoice in the Lord of all the years, uh, the God of all time, has worked many miracles for us, and he's triumphed gloriously in our lives. We just need to take the time to stop and see it. And so let's look at uh, this song of triumph. Uh, the first thing that we notice is that it was collective. It was a collective song of praise. Verse 1 says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. There's no qualifier like some of the children of Israel. Most of the children of Israel. It says Moses and the children of Israel sang this song unto the Lord. I'm sure that Moses would have uh, sung this song if no one else had joined him. But the Bible says that all Israel joined him. And then again in verse 20, it says that Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out, with, uh, went out after her with timbrels and dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So we must never take for granted the act of collective singing of God's praises. Now, that was one of the things that I missed the most when uh, everybody was going to live stream. Uh, everybody was, was going to you know, Facebook Live or maybe a recorded uh, service. But I missed singing together. I mean, I've, I've sang A Mighty Fortress three times now with Caleb and uh, sang it last night. Last night I wore glasses and, and 
priest with a mask on, that was like the worst mistake ever because my glasses just fogged up, you know, instantly. So I'm trying to, trying to read and, uh, you know, my glasses are fogging up, but, uh, all three times now that we have saying a mighty fortress, acapella, even, um, I've just, I get chills. I mean, I can't sing a mighty fortress is our God and not get chills. Uh, I don't, I don't know what it is. Just thinking about, uh, the mighty fortress that we have in God, uh, puts me in awe. It puts me in marvel. There's certain songs that they always do that to me at certain points. And, uh, I think how wonderful it is to hear everybody in this building singing and praising God together. It's an act of collective worship, collective praising God for what he has done. And in fact, we're commanded to rejoice in the Lord always. Now I made the mistake of, of questioning Larry, Pastor Larry on this. And you know, he's, he's a bit brainy. And, uh, I said, now I don't know the difference between always and always. Uh, when I think of always, uh, I think of just a general idea of all the time. Praise, praise God all the time. And that's good. But when I think of all way, uh, I think of uh, praising God in all the things, in all the ways uh, that we find ourselves in life. Praise him in all the hardships. Praise him in all the difficulties. Praise him in all the good times. Rejoice in the Lord all way. And again, I say rejoice. Now, I didn't know this during the previous two times, but Larry corrected me. He said, well, always really is just an arch archaic way of saying always. You know, so it kind of, <laughs> I get to spoil that for you now. But rejoice in the Lord always, all the time, through all the difficulty. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, when we sing together collectively... People that are going through good times, people that are going through times of victory, they can encourage those that are going through bad times, that it won't always be that way. Uh, you will not always be down in the valley. And that is powerful to see people in the church uh, watching other people or, or noticing that people who are going through bad times, people that are going through financial difficulty or some kind of family hardship or some kind of physical malady, some, some physical illness. When I see personally, when I see people who are, who I know are not doing well, uh, whether it is economic or whether it is physical hardship or whether it is some kind of family problem, when I see those people singing and praising God, it helps remind me that I can praise God too, because he's blessed me in, in, in more ways than I can count. He's done more for me than I could ever hope to uh, retell here today. And so when we sing uh, together, we help those that are going through bad times, remember that it will get better. And we help people that are going through good times, remember that it won't always be uh, so good. And we can still praise God anyways. And let's not forget that this uh, collective was made up of individuals. Uh, when we come together as a church, it's so easy to sing and praise God because everyone else is doing it, right? Uh, you don't want to stand out. You want to you wanna fit in. Uh, and, and I'm not doubting that everybody here was genuinely singing praises, okay? But when we go out from here, and when we don't have kind of the peer pressure of, of singing and, and making it look like everything's together, uh, when we don't have people there to encourage us, it's even more important to remember that we ought to praise God in those times as well. Colossians makes it clear that thankfulness and gratitude is vital to the Christian life. And uh, that's one of the reasons why God wants us to be mindful of other people uh, that are in, in church with us, that are a part of this body of believers. Uh, we need to keep each other in mind because it's not just an individual effort. It's a group effort. It was a collective of them singing praises to God. And so not only was it a collective song of praise, it was a triumphant song of praise. Verse, uh, the second part of verse one says, I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And as you look at the account of what God did at the Red Sea and what God continued to do in the wilderness, despite all their complaining, despite all their murmuring and wishing that God had killed them, uh, it was an absolute miracle what God did for the Israelites there in the wilderness. 
and, and throughout their history. It's an absolute miracle what God has done for us as Christians. Uh, that God would send his son to die on the cross for us so that we could know for sure that our sins are forgiven is an absolute miracle. I couldn't imagine giving up my son or my daughter for anybody. And yet God gave us his son so that we could have victory over sin and death. Jesus Christ's sacrifice has already won the victory for us. And just like the Israelites, uh, there was nothing to do except to obey. The Isra God didn't force them to walk through the Red Sea. But he provided a way for them to escape the Egyptians. And they obeyed. They walked through. And it's the same with us. But how often do we really take time to awe and marvel at what God has done for us? How often do we stop and ask God for forgiveness for our complaining? A lot of this comes because we forget just how good we have it. We forget uh, that we are living in a time of unprecedented comfort and privilege. I mean, the fact that we could come here uh, and, and be in a heated building. Many people don't enjoy that luxury around the world. We aren't facing real persecution like those that are living in Ethiopia, Sudan, Nigeria, the Middle East, China, North Korea, in, uh, uh, Indonesia. There are people that are facing persecution, being put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that that time won't come or, or, or may not come, uh, but we forget how good we have it here right now. And yet we act like the devil is on our throat, right? When we experience the mildest inconvenience, when someone cuts us, cuts us off in traffic, uh, when someone cuts us off in, in a line waiting in a store. And uh, I, could, I could, you know, sit here and expound on my personal gripe that grocery, grocery checkout lines have individual lines where, you know, if one's moving faster, someone can just like shoot over there in front of everybody else that's been waiting for five minutes and... Um, we won't go into that here, but it's easy how those, it's amazing how easy it is for us to start complaining in those little situations. Like, uh, the devil's ready to just take our life right then and there. That's not the case. Like I said earlier, it's, it's a lot of times it's our own foolishness, uh, our own selfishness, our own ingratitude. Uh, but that's not triumphant. When I think of triumphant, I think of Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus is telling the disciples that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Now, how many of you have a gate at your house? You've, you have some kind of fence or a door even. I mean, when you go to the store, you don't take your gate with you, right? Or your door. You don't pull it off the hinges and, and, and take it with you. No, the, the door is there to keep people from going in. Uh, the door is there as a defensive measure against the elements, against people, against animals, against all kinds of things. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against our attack. All right, so that implies that we are going forward with the gospel, that we are attacking the gates of hell. Uh, and the Bible says, uh, Jesus himself says that those gates will not prevail when we are going forward. Now that is triumphant. It's not about fear. It's not about uh, all the, the, the walls are closing in. It's about us going forward with the gospel. Now it's, it's not a call to arms, okay? It, it's not a call to physical arms. We should take up our armor, our spiritual armor, as it says, says in uh, Ephesians 6, taking our, our, our spiritual armor so that we can stand against all the wiles of the devil. Uh, it's not a... a uh, attack against uh, some person or, or a group of people. It's against Satan. And it's not for some earthly kingdom, but it is for the kingdom of God, which is built in people's hearts. So are we triumphant or are we on the defense? Are we fearful? So it was a collective song of praise. It was a triumphant song of praise, but it was also a short-lived song of praise. In uh, verse 22, it says, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, I can, I can imagine getting pretty upset after three days of finding no water. What, what's, the, what's the liquid version of being hangry when, like, you're, 
you're really thirsty. It, do we call it the same thing or is there another phrase that, no, okay. <clears throat> so they're, they're getting upset and rightfully so. I mean, if, if I had to start rationing water uh, because I didn't know where the next drink was going to come from, I would be pretty upset. But instead of trusting in God, they began to complain. Look at verse 24, excuse me, 23. When they came to Marah, they could not drink for the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now, it's not that God didn't provide water. It's not that he didn't have a plan. It's that the Israelites weren't thankful and they weren't patient enough to wonder what is that plan. They didn't ask God, okay, here's water, what can we do? So, verse 25, he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, if thou wilt did diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and three score and 10 palm trees. And they encamped there by the waters. So right here, they've gone three days without water. Okay. Understandably upset. Your body is not really meant to go more than a day without the necessary amount of water, much less three days. And yet, instead of asking God, you know, what, what's the plan? They begin to complain. And so God shows Moses what to do. But now look at verse uh, one of chapter 16, if you're able. And they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sinai, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So this is about a month after they've crossed the Red Sea. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we had sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now again, it's not that God didn't have a plan. God knew that this was going to happen. He created, or, you know, he made it possible for manna to fall from heaven every day, except for the seventh day, except for the Sabbath. And he knew that this was going to happen. But instead of trusting God, instead of being thankful that, that God had a plan and we just needed to be patient to see what it was, they complained. They complained to Moses. And then Moses went before God and said, God, what are we going to do? And he showed them what they would do. But isn't it amazing how quickly they turn from, oh, this is a great and marvelous victory that God has won for us, to God brought us out into this wilderness to die. It, it's, how, it, it, it's amazing how quickly we go from mountaintops of great spiritual victory to valleys of wishing that you know, we would die or that uh, we doubt God's love for us because of how hard things seem at the time. And, um, you know, I spoke about getting my pilot's licenses and, 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 and going through that process. And, you know, when, when you're flying up in, you know, this little airplane, it's just a miracle that it should happen, you know, that we can defy gravity in that way. And to me, it's a, it's a marvelous feeling. It makes me think of when I would go flying with my dad when I was younger. And then, you know, I land and I check my messages and, you know, there's some emergency at home or I've got to go to the grocery store or I get a message from uh, work, you know, asking me if I can work extra the next week. And I'm like, man, I don't want to do that. You know, com complaining against the job that I wanted so that, uh, you know, we could help meet, you know, needs and, and, and take care of the costs associated with learning how to fly. Uh, it's amazing how quickly we go from a place of thankfulness and awe and wonder at what God has done in our lives to uh, complaining against the very same thing. You know, I think of people that uh, move from one place to another, or they move from one station and situation in life to another, and then how quickly 
they complain about maybe the new job responsibilities or the new difficulties of, of living in a new place. And they began to wish for the place that they lived uh, before. The Israelites were doing this. They said, oh, I wish, I, I wish God had just let us die in Egypt where uh, we had enjoyed uh, eating as much meat as we want and eating as much bread as we wanted. We don't have those things out here. And yet they forgot the bondage and the slavery and the fact that uh, when they complained to Pharaoh about everything that they had to go through, Pharaoh made it even more difficult for them by saying that they had to fetch their own straw and water to make the bricks for all these different building projects. And so they forgot how hard they had it. We get in those situations too, where we're in this new, this, uh, uh, new place, new station in life, and uh, things get difficult. So we complain and wish we had gone back to the, the, the previous station, maybe the, the previous city that you were living in or the previous job that you had. And we forget that when we were in that previous situation, we were complaining about that situation a lot of times. Maybe not all the time, but a lot of times we're, we were complaining about that previous situation and wishing we could go back to the one before that. And we stop being thankful for where God has brought us in this time. So it was a, it was a short lived song of praise. Three days is all that lasted for the Israelites. How long does it last for us? Also think of Peter when he's called to walk out on the water and, you know, here he is walking on water. Uh, you know, I would think that that's about second to flying an airplane. Okay. My personal opinion, but Peter's walking on water. He's looking at Jesus Christ who is walking on the water as well. And all of a sudden a wave comes and and causes Peter to sink. Now, it wasn't the wave that caused him to sink. The wave had no power to cause him to sink. What had the power to cause him to sink was that he took his eyes off of Jesus. When we are experiencing those places of victory, uh, those times of, of just, um, you know, feeling like we're on top of the world, uh, the thing that causes us to sink is when we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're like Peter and you've taken your eyes off of Jesus Christ and you've gone from this place of great victory and this place of great triumph uh, to feeling like you were going to drown. Uh, there's some sin in your life that uh, has caused you to take your eye off of Jesus. The great thing is that there's wonderful news. There's grace and mercy. And we have no further to look than uh, what happened to the Israelites. We saw how God provided water in spite of their complaining. God provided food, manna, every single day except for the Sabbath day for 40 years in spite of their complaining, in spite of thinking that God had brought them out into the wilderness to die. God provided that food for them. And so there's grace and mercy for each and every one of us. Peter He's out on the water. He sees the wave. He begins to sink. And though Jesus did say to him, oh, ye of little faith, he didn't beat him over the head. He didn't hold his head down under the water, you know, and make him, uh, you know, really, really feel bad for taking his eyes off of Jesus. Jesus stretches out his hand, pulls him up out of the water and walks back to the boat with him. He didn't beat him down because of it. He forgave him for taking his eyes off of Jesus. There's grace and mercy and forgiveness for our times of faithlessness and ingratitude. And I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. This isn't about, uh, you know, adding a little bit of Jesus to your daily routine. This isn't uh, a, a self-help routine where you just do more and you try harder. Uh, it's all about Jesus. It's all about resting in him. As I said before, uh, when God parted the Red Sea, all the Israelites had to do was obey. All they had to do was go across. Hebrews talks a lot about rest. Jesus himself said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is that rest? That rest, Hebrews talks about saying that those who have entered into God's rest have ceased from their own works. There is work that is done for God, and there's work that is done in God. And many of you know the difference. The work that is done for God doesn't get you any closer to God. 
It doesn't make him love you any more than he already loves you. It doesn't make you look better in God's eyes. But the work that is done in God through his Holy Spirit, that has everlasting fruit that we'll never see in this lifetime. And, and uh, we'll only see when we get to heaven. The rest that is done in God uh, is so much more powerful in the lives of other people than running about, making it look like you're busy, making it look like uh, if you weren't here, this place would fall apart, all right? Uh, the work that is done in God, uh, if it were to go away, people would notice. But a lot of times the work that is done for God, trying to impress him or trying to uh, uh, impress other people, if that were to go away, no one would notice. Uh, and so resting in God. Uh, I also think of Psalm 22, verse 3, where it says that he inhabits the praise of Israel. Look at, um, look at verse 2 of Exodus chapter 15. Uh, I'll read it for you. He says, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. How could Moses prepare him a habitation? Maybe he knew about the, the ark uh, and the tabernacle that would be built, but I don't think he's talking about that. I think he's talking about his praise is going to become a habitation for God to live in. And it just illustrates how important it is for us to have an attitude of thankfulness and praise to God because God inhabits that praise. But we do fail, don't we? There are times that we take our eyes off of God. There are times that we uh, sin, that, that uh, we feel like we've done the worst thing that we could ever do. And yet, even in those times, there's grace and mercy and forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, he's faithful. He will do it every time. Every time you ask him, to forgive you and to cleanse you, he will do it when you repent of your sin. And yet it also says that he is just. You know what that term just means, right? Uh, I used just in a sentence the other day, and um, Zeke was like, Daddy, what do you mean just? It's just this or it's just that. I'm like, well, you know, it, it means it's only that or only this or, you know, just has so many different meanings that sometimes we forget that the primary use of just is how we get our word justice. It means that God is just. He is right. Uh, he is legally correct in forgiving us every time we ask him because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So when we fail, when when we take our eyes off of God, when uh, we sin, when uh, we do the thing that we never thought we could, remember to confess that sin and to ask him to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I want to ask you, did you let 2020 win? Did you let something in your life, something that happened to you this past year, maybe even this past week, take your eyes off of God and become fearful, begin to sink in the water and in the waves? Have you lost your thankfulness or do you struggle with faithlessness and not believing that God could ever save you from these circumstances? Or maybe you'd say that you even struggle with knowing that you're saved. I, there may be some people here who don't even know what I'm talking about. What is salvation? What does it mean to uh, accept Jesus Christ as your savior? I want you to know that there is hope in this life. Things are, are, are not without hope. Uh, there is great hope in God. And uh, it comes from the eternal God who made it possible for us to spend eternity with him. Uh, and if you want to know more about uh, what that is or, or how you can know for sure that you have a, your sins forgiven and a home in heaven, you can speak to myself or one of the pastors here. Um, Christian, you can have victory in your life. And really it all comes from thankfulness remembering what God has done for us in our lives. You can be thankful for what God has done for you in this day, in this week, and even in this year. It's been a tough year, no doubt, but God is faithful, and he will forgive us every time we take our eyes off of him.